I take a lot of pride in my positive attitude. Ever since I was young, it's something I've been known for. My friends and family call me an optimist and know me as someone they can rely on for a smile or cheering up. My whole life, I've worked hard to create and share this persona, hopeful, optimistic, positive. When things are tough, I want to be looked to to help raise morale. In recent years, I've learned that people don't always need positivity. Sometimes they just need someone to listen. Validation, saying I hear you, that sounds really hard, can be as or far more helpful than phrases like, it could be worse, or well, at least X, Y, and Z, or look on the bright side. I've received all those responses at different times in my life, and I've offered them as well. I imagine we all have, in an effort to be supportive, to show that we're listening, and to help when someone we love is going through a hard time. We have an instinct to help, to show support, to even contextualize the suffering or grief of our loved ones. We have these instincts because we're good people. We're caring people. But following this instinct is not always helpful. Hearing it could be worse can feel like my pain is being minimized. Telling someone to just think of the bright side or look for the silver lining can come across as if we don't understand or care about their experience. There's a concept called toxic positivity. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Which is becoming more prevalent, more well-known and talked about. The psychology group defines it as the excessive and ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic state across all situations. And says the process of toxic positivity results in the denial, minim minimization, and invalidation of the authentic human emotional experience. In other words, there's a time and a place for optimism. Sometimes it's more healthy and productive for us to sit in and acknowledge whatever difficulty we're facing. To be validating and say, I hear you, that must be challenging. I've been able to practice this throughout rabbinical school, in chaplaincy work, and perhaps mostly in marriage. <laughs> Our focus on positivity is a reaction to discomfort. It's hard to know what to say or do when we're faced with someone's stress, depression, or grief. It's difficult to just sit in sadness. We're not good at it, so we tend towards optimism. We look for something positive we can share. But as hard and uncomfortable as it is, it's healthy and important to feel our emotions. It's important to give ourselves the gift of processing our feelings, acknowledging and validating that we're sad, frustrated, mad, overwhelmed, whatever it is. I've been thinking about this idea of unnecessary or unhelpful positivity in relation to the Parsha since I read Nechama Leibowitz's commentary on it earlier this week. Dr. Leibowitz pointed out an interesting linguistic shift in Joseph's speech to his brothers as he reveals his identity to them. The verb mem kaf resh, selling or sold, is dropped at a certain point in exchange for a different verb from the root shin lamed chet, sent or sending. Joseph begins by saying, it's me, Joseph, your brother, asher mechartem oti mitzrayma, who you sold to Egypt. And he continues, again referencing his brothers selling him into slavery. You all sold me into slavery. But then there's a change. God sent me here to ensure your survival. Joseph shifts into this God sent me trope and continues it for the rest of his speech. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God, to be Pharaoh's chancellor and to rule over Egypt. This is a pretty drastic shift in Joseph's version of the events of his life story. Joseph, who was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, put in jail, 
that Joseph is able in this moment in the Parsha to find a way to say that his life journey was divine providence, presenting himself not as a victim, but as a key piece of God's plan to save Egypt, his family, and really the world as they knew it from devastation and famine. Lo atem shlachtem oti, it wasn't you who sent me here, ki ha Elohim, but God. Nechama Leibowitz writes, at this point, the verb mem kaf resh, selling or sold, appears no more and is forgotten. What had originally appeared as a criminal deed of kidnapping now stands revealed in its true perspective as part of a providential scheme for saving life and furthering the national <laughs> destiny. All, all week I've been struggling with this because it's obviously both, right? Joseph must realize that it was his brother who cast him away, who threw him out, who sold him into slavery. He was a victim. His life was really, really bad. But here it sounds like he's ignoring that in order to say, ah, see, this was part of the plan all along. And so I worry about Joseph because I wonder, is this toxic positivity? Is he ignoring or skipping over his hardships? Or perhaps is he offering us a lesson that we can learn and what it means to process our emotions in a healthy way. In his senior sermon at JTS, my friend and teacher, Rabbi Daniel Novik, talked about Joseph in the pit. Now, of course, the pit is one particular moment in Joseph's stories, but we read it as any of life's low points. Rabbi Novik taught that the pit is a space where normal logic and law do not seem to function. The initial instinct of calling out and asking to be set free does not always work. And so at some point after crying out and not being heard, the question Joseph asks changes, changed, from how do I get out of here to how do I dwell in here? The question how do I dwell in here allows us to ask what strength and resolve do I have in my soul for this moment? And how might this pit provide a place for learning, growth, or improvement? When we push ourselves to try to find silver linings, when we say, oh, at least it's not A, B, and C, we remove the opportunity to ask, how do I dwell in here? We get swept away by the external by looking outward and deny ourselves the chance to process our emotions and our experiences. Rabbi Novik teaches that life's low points can be an opportunity for growth and self-reflection, and yet, admittedly and importantly, this growth, this development happens mainly in retrospect. Looking back, perhaps Joseph can see his life as being a positive, albeit difficult experience. Yet during his journey, while in the depth of these pits, it may have been, it often is much more difficult to bask the darkness in a positive light. For the last couple months, it's felt a little like we are living in a pit. As Israelis and Palestinians continue to die, as hostages are still unaccounted for, and horrifying images and stories come out from Israel and Gaza, all I've been able to think is how do I get out of here? Mostly it's lonely in this pit. It feels like the world has placed impossible expectations on me and on us. I'm fighting instincts to find and focus on moments of positivity on the one hand, but I'm also exhausted from intentionally feeling all these emotions. And so I look to Torah for guidance. And here we arrive back at the moment of the big reveal. Joseph, standing before his brothers. He says to them, it's me, your brother Joseph. God sent me here to lead Egypt and to save you. Joseph shows us that he is out of his pit, that with the help of time and in hindsight, it's possible to appreciate learning, growth, and improvement that came from devastation and hopelessness, that we can realize the blessings that come from darkness. And at the same time, we learn that in order to get to the blessings, we first have to be in the pit. We have to learn to just express our own emotions and practice sitting with others as they learn to name theirs. 
then we can replace toxic positivity with meaningful listening and valuable relationship. As we continue to experience individual and communal pits, may we find strength in each other, may we listen lovingly, validate readily, and learn from Joseph that even in the darkest moments there is potential for hope. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.